Hello, everybody. This is Chuck Carnival, co-founder of Fast Graphs, the Fundamentals Analyzer software tool. I want to welcome you again to my Subscriber Request Tuesday series that I like to do every Tuesday. This particular week is going to be kind of an electrifying video, if you will, because one of the requests I've received actually quite commonly is I've been asked about several of the electronic vehicle, the EV electronic car market, companies like Stella Lannis, Neo, of course, Tesla, and so on. So I'm going to cover that industry today and try to give you maybe some insights into the automobile industry in general, but also what I like and what I don't like about this particular category and then some of the companies that are trading in it. So let's go ahead and take a look at the electronic vehicle industry. First of all, I did start out, I did a screen going through fast graphs, and I just simply did a screen on automobile manufacturers. And according to FactSet, there are 65 companies out of 25,000 in the database that actually screen out as automobile manufacturers. Of course, you've got names like you know, Aston Martin, BMW, of course, Mercedes. You've got General Motors, Ford, Toyota, Fisker, Subaru, right down the line. And one of the things that I've learned in doing a little bit of research to kind of cover these is almost every one of these, of course, Neo, which I'll be covering, almost every one of these companies are currently involved in the electronic vehicle and even the self-driving vehicle business right now. So it's becoming a pretty crowded field. You know, Tesla is obviously the name everybody associates with the industry, but Neo, which is a Chinese company, is obviously a big player as well. But every other car manufacturer is thinking about entering this market. So there was an article in the Wall Street Journal about a week ago, I think it was April 23rd, titled How Electric Self-Driving Cars and Ride Hailing Will Transform the Car Industry. The area launched by Henry Ford more than a century ago is coming to an end. And the big question is whether the U.S. can keep up with China in the new race. Welcome to the world of auto tech. Well, some very interesting points were made in this article that you can you know, find it in the Wall Street Journal for those of you who subscribe. One of the things I found interesting was that, you know, starting in 2035, for example, General Motors intends to make only electric cars. And they're talking about from their least expensive model that they're selling in China to the Cadillac Celestic at $200,000 plus. Also, the article talked about how governments are really driving the shift. We all know about the new Green Deal. We've all heard that California's banned selling gasoline cars after 2035. Britain is aiming to do that by 2030. And China will allow only electrics or hybrids to be sold starting in 2035. And of course, the Biden administration's infrastructure bill includes about $174 billion to support electric cars. And the article points out that's 50% more than for bridges and roads, which, by the way, I think we need the bridges and roads pretty badly. But anyway, you know, it, the reality of it is not only is it electric vehicles, but also self-driving cars. According to the article, self-driving cars clocked 2 million miles of test driving on California roads in 2020 alone. And of course, they said an end anxiety boarding on alarm is quietly running through the auto world at reports that Apple which I talk about you know, probably too often, is working on its own Apple brand that's self-driving electric car. So, you know, the electric industry is certainly, electric vehicle industry and the, and the self-driving industry is really coming to fay. And, you know, um, China's Baidu is one of the world's largest internet and artificial intelligence companies has already started putting robot taxis on the road in Beijing and other parts of China. And, you know, the article goes on to point out, welcome to the new world of auto tech, the merging of electronic autonomous vehicles with ride hailing to create a radically different car economy. So, you know, this is really disruptive technology. I think we're all aware of that. You know, the automobile industry is certainly in flux. But, you know, the automobile industry has been one that I've basically eschewed for most of my career. I found it very, very difficult to make money in the automobile sector. And, you know, I'm going to show you some examples of that here in a moment. I just wonder, after reading this article and all the points that they made, you know, they talked in the article about how there was a young electric vehicle enthusiast named J.B. Straubel who had lunch with Elon Musk in 2003. And he had this harebrained idea that we could use what were then only laptop cells and power a car with them. It was a mill that changed the automobile industry. Without that lunch, Mr. Musk later said Tesla wouldn't exist, basically. So, you know, this is all really happening at a very fast pace. We know the success that Tesla's had. You know, and what Tesla did, they kind of took an interesting approach. Rather than make all these little, you know, 
kind of ugly, tiny little cars that they felt the, the electric vehicle industry had to make, that Tesla decided that the objective was to get a beautiful, stylish car that could go 300 miles on a battery and that even cost up to $100,000 or more. So the electric vehicle industry is really quite a fascinating industry. So I'm going to cover some of the more important ones here. I'm not going to go over all you know, 65 that I showed you earlier, but I want to look at the obviously the classic U.S. manufacturers, Ford and Chevy. I want to show the Chinese manufacturer, Neo, and then Stell Anthus, I guess is how you pronounce that, is the, was really the merger between uh, Peugeot and Fiat, and they created this, you know, big company. I'm going to show you some interesting things about them. And of course, I'm going to just briefly go back over Tesla, which I've covered numerous times before. But let's start with Stell Anthus, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, this merger. And, you know, if you really look at this company, it, it's had actually one of the better earnings records, if you will, as I'll show you, it'll become clear here in a few moments, of any of the automobile stocks that I've ever followed. But then they had this, you know, this big merger, and now they've initiated a dividend. They'll start paying a dividend um, in 2020 and 2021. I'm not showing that yet on the fast graphs, but there is an expected dividend going on in the future for the stock. Earnings growth is expected to be very strong over the next couple of years, and that's kind of important because if I go to the forecasting graph, you'll see that, you know, even if you use the normal P.E. ratio for the last five years has only been seven. The stock is currently trading at about 9.57 times earnings or just call it nine and a half times earnings. That would still mean that there would be if, if they hit all these earnings estimates and the stock actually only traded at this 7.37 P.E., then you'd have, you know, this 21 percent rate of return. If it traded at even 11 or 12 times earnings, that you'd be looking at 34, 35% rate of returns. If it traded at its expected growth rate of 20 times earnings, you'd be looking at 58% rate of return. So assuming Stella Anthus is able to make these numbers and generate you know, these valuation levels, there's obviously a lot of money to be made. But I do want you to notice that if I look at the analyst scorecard for this company, you know, the last couple of years have been pretty bad and they did miss it pretty bad in 2012. And of course, the recession was pretty bad as well. And obviously, 2020 and 2019 had, you know, a lot of impact from COVID there. So, you know, the company's, you know, earnings growth did falter during COVID. Like, you know, they closed dealerships, they stopped manufacturing cars, all the manufacturers, not just the Landis. But then the company went through this big merger, which brings me to something. I get a lot of questions. I Probably the most commonly asked question I get is, how come my numbers are always different on the fast graph reports and what you see from other websites like Yahoo Finance? And the reason for it is we're using adjusted operating earnings as our go-to metric, which is, you know, some people call it reported earnings. Not all companies do report it, but it's more of an operating earnings picture. If we go to gap earnings and look at diluted earnings, which are also known as gap earnings, you will see discrepancies. And for example, in the case of Stellantis here, they, you know, went through this big merger. And so what we ended up having here was, you know, a big drop in earnings as a result of charge offs and so on that are, you know, impacted with a merger like that. But yet the stock price really did pretty well. It didn't really falter. That's one of the reasons why I don't like to use Gap. And then, of course, I also want to point out that we have all these other metrics as well. For example, operating cash flow is a metric I like to look at, especially for dividend paying stocks. What I'm really looking for is to see if cash flow is covering the dividend. That just makes it maybe a feel good thing. I don't necessarily, you know, look at this metric from a standpoint of valuation. But as you can see, you know, the it was really you're talking about, I think this is Fiat's actual chart, if I'm not mistaken. You know, the company actually traded at about two times cash flow historically. It's currently trading at about 2.3 times cash flow. So that would indicate that it's fairly valuable. But I do want to also be clear about something else here. When you see a big merger like this, or, you know, when you see some of these, even some of these spinoffs, you're really not looking at the company as it currently is. You're looking at the company that existed, you know, prior to the big merger here. But there are things to learn about that. So anyway, this looks like a very attractive stock um, based on its, you know, expected earnings growth, as well as, you know, the current valuation that you can buy. It. It's fairly valued, no matter how you want to measure it, in my opinion, even using all these different metrics. Bottom line, is 
I can measure this stock in so many different ways, you know, price to earnings, price to cash flow, et cetera, and determine that it's very, very inexpensive. Now, if I contrast that to some of these others, like if I go to the mighty Tesla, you can see that Tesla is expected to start earning money, but they really haven't made any money historically. In fact, it's really hard to even, even draw a graph of Tesla because, you know, the company was had very, very poor operating results, was losing money most years in 2015, 16, 17, and 18. And note that their stock, as I pointed out before, went sideways. There was really no money to be made in Tesla for this whole you know, five or six year period here. You squeeze out a little bit, but it wasn't really a great investment until, you know, we got into the you know, early 2019. Then we've had this huge run up and now it's faltering. But here's the point. Tesla is the, you know, like the model, if you will. It's the ideal for the electric car manufacturers. But companies like Stellantis have some really interesting aspects going on. For example, Stellantis is actually looking at hydrogen fuel cell for zero emissions. Now, they're really looking at light trucks and things where they longer haul carriers, where they believe the hydrogen fuel cell would be more efficient than just a pure electric battery. They're also filling it up with hydrogen, so it takes only a few minutes for the you know, the cars or the trucks to be refueled compared to the electric cars right now that have to be. But again, there's this major commitment where these guys are, you know, all these guys are getting involved in electric vehicles of some kind going forward. And again, they're looking at the light truck industry where, you know, they feel like for the longer hauls, they can really generate more power. So very, very interesting what's going on here. Now, if I go on and look at some of these others beyond Tesla, then you also have NEO, which again is the Chinese company. And again, almost an identical picture to Tesla, if you will, metaphorically. A company didn't make any money at all for the first three or four years, expected to start earning a profit. Going forward, you know, we're not really expecting a profit until 2023. I do want to make that clear. That's what I'm showing you here. So, you know, this is all hype, if you will. There's not a lot of fundamentals supporting this. From a price to sales point of view, even the price to sales has gotten very high at over 29 times sales. So these stocks, Tesla, Neo, are very, very expensive. Now, Neo kind of controls the Chinese market, although Tesla's trying to do business there. Uh, moderate success, not great success. But the reality of it is, you know, other automobile manufacturers have a whole different picture. I mentioned, you know, Ford and General Motors both. Now, General Motors graph is a little funny because they came out of bankruptcy, I think in 2011. But I do want you to notice they've struggled to make any money and they did slash their dividend during the COVID process. That's very typical. But I was asked about Ford. This is another stock I'm asked about quite often. And they're talking about Ford. Now, what I want to mention here, if I look at this stock purely from, you know, fundamentals, it might not look that bad. You know, and of course, they've eliminated their dividend. And, you know, the earnings have fallen dramatically and earnings are expected to increase dramatically over the next year or two. So the forward P.E. on this stock would actually be quite low, frankly. And if I looked at it from a forecasting point of view, assuming these earnings came into play and the company did grow earnings at around an 18 percent rate, which is what, you know, this forecast is showing. And I you know do want to also point out that the forecasts for the two year forecast, the 2022 forecast has actually increased, but the 2021 forecast has actually decreased a little bit. So, you know, a lot of stuff going on here, but it's still expected to grow earnings at over 140 percent for this year. If I go out just a couple of years, which is typically about as far as I like to go, you know, even with a flat year expected to a moderately down year in 2023, if this stock traded just at the normal 15 times earnings, this would be 14.7. You could make 25 to 30 percent a year. If it traded at its growth rate of 18 percent, which I doubt it would because it would be flattening earnings here. But you could look at it here, it might, which would be a you know 75 to 80 percent annualized rate of return. So Ford looks real attractive here. But let me show you a couple of things that you ought to be aware of. When I look at the analyst scorecard for the one year or the two year forecast here, and I'll just show you the summary here, analysts get it wrong about half the time when they were trying to forecast Ford's earnings. I also want you to notice this. This is the 20 year going back to 2001 at least record for Ford. And I want you to notice the earnings here have been all over the board and even fell precipitously. But the stock price, if you'd have bought this stock, and I'll just go ahead to the performance here in the beginning, actually the date was December 29th, 2000, and held it all the way through yesterday's close. 
and invested $10,000 in the stock, your $10,000 would be worth $4,962. That's a minus negative 3.4% annualized loss, if you will. The company did have a dividend record. They did pay another 3000 in dividends. So you'd have ended up with about $8,196 worth of your 10000 that you originally invested, a negative 1% a year rate of return. Most of it, all of it, really, if you want to look at it from that point of view, or the, certainly the majority of it came from the dividends, but the dividends record itself was also very spotty. You can see where they slashed their dividends numerous times and even eliminated their dividends at times. The point of the story here is it's very, very difficult for these automobile manufacturers to make any money. It's why I've you know, basically stayed away from the industry in total. Now, I could look at you know, a lot of other examples here that you, know, you might find interesting and you know, you're going to see that it's just a lot of these companies, you know, Subaru, which obviously is a, you know, a well-named brand with their crazy little motor and everything. This car company has a record a little bit better than Ford's, but it also has lost money and cut dividends and so on. So these guys have a lot of trouble making money. It's capital intensive. When you're looking at these big names like Tesla and Neo, these guys are trading at stratospheric valuations. And the whole point that I'm trying to get across here. There's an enormous amount of competition coming their way. And it's going to be hard to say who the winners are. It's going to be hard to say if there are any winners. I do think it's a disruptive technology. I do think it's fascinating to look at. You know, if I was going to invest in this industry, and I'm probably not, I think I would pick Solantis because I do think the company has at least some fundamental attributes right now that might make it attractive going forward. I'd certainly rather bet my money here at these multiples and with a 10 percent you know, earnings yield currently and expected earnings yield to continue to grow or earnings continuing to grow in the future than I would risk, even though I would argue that Tesla might be a better company, at least currently, or even Neo might be a better company. I would just be hard pressed to pay these astronomical valuations for these stocks, where in this case, you know, I also have a major player. It's I think it's now the third largest automobile manufacturer in the world, and I can buy it at a very inexpensive valuation. So it's a very, very interesting industry. Lots going to be happening, a lot to write about, a lot to talk about. There's going to be a lot of hype. I would just say be very careful investing in this industry and pay great attention to not only how your companies are doing, but what's going on in the rest of the industry. Anyway, it's been Chuck Carnival. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, give me a like, give me a thumbs up, ring the bell, you know, subscribe to my channel, etc. I really appreciate this. This is another one of my subscriber request series videos. Thanks for watching.